Who is Steve Jobs? Great quotes from Steve Jobs about success. Stephen Paul Jobs, February 24, 1955 to October 5, 2011 was an American businessman, inventor, and investor best known for co-founding the technology giant Apple Inc. Jobs was also the founder of Next and chairman and majority shareholder of Pixar. He was a pioneer of the personal computer revolution of the 1970s and 1980s, along with his early business partner and fellow Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak. Jobs was born in San Francisco in 1955 and adopted shortly afterwards. He attended Reed College in 1972 before withdrawing that same year. In 1974, he traveled through India, seeking enlightenment before later studying Zen Buddhism. He and Wozniak co-founded Apple in 1976 to further develop and sell Wozniak's Apple I personal computer. Together, the duo gained fame and wealth a year later with production and sale of the Apple II, one of the first highly successful mass-produced microcomputers. Jobs saw the commercial potential of the Xerox Alto in 1979, which was mouse-driven and had a graphical user interface, GUI. This led to the development of the unsuccessful Apple Lisa in 1983, followed by the breakthrough Macintosh in 1984, the first mass-produced computer with a GUI. The Macintosh introduced the desktop publishing industry in 1985 with the addition of the Apple LaserWriter, the first laser printer to feature vector graphics. In 1985, Jobs departed Apple after a long power struggle with the company's board and its then-CEO, John Scully. That same year, Jobs took some Apple employees with him to found Next, a computer platform development company that specialized in computers for higher education and business markets, serving as its CEO. In 1986, he helped develop the visual effects industry by funding the computer graphics division of Lucasfilm that eventually spun off independently as Pixar which produced the first 3D computer animated feature film Toy Story, 1995, and became a leading animation studio, producing over 27 films since. In 1997, Jobs returned to Apple as CEO after the company's acquisition of Next. He was largely responsible for reviving Apple, which was on the verge of bankruptcy. He worked closely with British designer Joni Ive to develop a line of products and services that had larger cultural ramifications beginning with the Think Different advertising campaign, and leading to the iMac, iTunes, Mac OS X, Apple Store, iPod, iTunes Store, iPhone, App Store, and iPad. In 2003, Jobs was diagnosed with a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. He died of respiratory arrest related to the tumor in 2011, and in 2022, was posthumously awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Stephen Paul Jobs was born in San Francisco, California, on February 24, 1955, to Joanne Carol Schiebel and Abdulfada, John, Jandali. Abdulfada Jandali was born in a Muslim household to wealthy Syrian parents, the youngest of nine siblings. After obtaining his undergraduate degree at the American University of Beirut, Jandali pursued a Ph.D. in political science at the University of Wisconsin. There, he met Joanne Schiebel, an American Catholic of Swiss-German descent whose parents owned a mink farm and real estate. The two fell in love but faced opposition from Schiebel's father due to Jandali's Muslim faith. When Schiebel became pregnant, she arranged for a closed adoption, and traveled to San Francisco to give birth. Schiebel requested that her son be adopted by college graduates. A lawyer and his wife were selected, but they withdrew after discovering that the baby was a boy. So Jobs was instead adopted by Paul Reinhold and Clara, nay Hagopian, Jobs. Paul Jobs was the son of a dairy farmer. After dropping out of high school, he worked as a mechanic, then joined the U.S. Coast Guard. When his ship was decommissioned, he bet he could find a wife within two weeks. He then met Clara Hagopian, an American of Armenian descent, and the two were engaged ten days later, in March 1946, and married that same year. The couple moved to Wisconsin, then Indiana, where Paul Jobs worked as a machinist and later as a car salesman. Since Clara missed San Francisco, she convinced Paul to move back. There, Paul worked as a repossession agent, and Clara became a bookkeeper. In 1955, after having an ectopic pregnancy, the couple looked to adopt a child. Since they lacked a college education, Schiebel initially refused to sign the adoption papers, and went to court to request that her son be removed from the Jobs household and placed with a different family 
but changed her mind after Paul and Clara promised to pay for their son's college tuition. In his youth, Jobs's parents took him to a Lutheran church. When Steve was in high school, Clara admitted to his girlfriend, Chris Ann Brennan, that she was too frightened to love for the first six months of his life. I was scared they were going to take him away from me. Even after we won the case, Steve was so difficult a child that by the time he was two I felt we had made a mistake. I wanted to return him. When Chris Ann shared this comment with Steve, he stated that he was already aware, and later said that he had been deeply loved and indulged by Paul and Clara. Many years later, Jobs's wife Lorene also noted that, he felt he had been really blessed by having the two of them as parents. Jobs would, bristle, when Paul and Clara were referred to as his, adoptive parents, and he regarded them as his parents, 1000%. Jobs referred to his biological parents as, my sperm and egg bank. That's not harsh, it's just the way it was, a sperm bank thing, nothing more. Paul Jobs worked in several jobs that included a try as a machinist, several other jobs, and then, back to work as a machinist. Paul and Clara adopted Jobs's sister Patricia in 1957, and by 1959 the family had moved to the Monte Loma neighborhood in Mountain View, California. Paul built a workbench in his garage for his son in order to pass along his love of mechanics. Jobs, meanwhile, admired his father's craftsmanship because he knew how to build anything. If we needed a cabinet, he would build it. When he built our fence, he gave me a hammer so I could work with him. I wasn't that into fixing cars, but I was eager to hang out with my dad. By the time he was 10, Jobs was deeply involved in electronics and befriended many of the engineers who lived in the neighborhood. He had difficulty making friends with children his own age, however, and was seen by his classmates as a loner. Jobs had difficulty functioning in a traditional classroom, tended to resist authority figures, frequently misbehaved, and was suspended a few times. Clara had taught him to read as a toddler, and Jobs stated that he was pretty bored in school and had turned into a little terror. You should have seen us in the third grade, we basically destroyed the teacher. He frequently played pranks on others at Monte Loma Elementary School in Mountain View. His father Paul, who was abused as a child, never reprimanded him, however, and instead blamed the school for not challenging his brilliant son. Jobs would later credit his fourth grade teacher, Imogene Teddy Hill, with turning him around. She taught an advanced fourth grade class, and it took her about a month to get hip to my situation. She bribed me into learning. She would say, I really want you to finish this workbook. I'll give you five bucks if you finish it. That really kindled a passion in me for learning things. I learned more that year than I think I learned in any other year in school. They wanted me to skip the next two years in grade school and go straight to junior high to learn a foreign language, but my parents very wisely wouldn't let it happen. Jobs skipped the fifth grade and transferred to the sixth grade at Crittenden Middle School in Mountain View, where he became a socially awkward loner. Jobs was often bullied at Crittenden Middle, and in the middle of seventh grade, he gave his parents an ultimatum. Either they would take him out of Crittenden or he would drop out of school. The Jobs family was not affluent, and only by expending all their savings were they able to buy a new home in 1967, allowing Steve to change schools. The new house, a three-bedroom home on Chris Drive in Los Altos, California, was in the better Cupertino School District, Cupertino, California, and was embedded in an environment even more heavily populated with engineering families than the Mountain View area was. The house was declared a historic site in 2013, as the first site of Apple Computer. 16. As of 2013, it was owned by Jobs's sister, Patty, and occupied by his stepmother, Marilyn. When he was 13, in 1968, Jobs was given a summer job by Bill Hewlett, of Hewlett Packard, after Jobs Cold called him to ask for parts for an electronics project. The location of the Los Altos home meant that Jobs would be able to attend nearby Homestead High School, which had strong ties to Silicon Valley. He began his first year there in late 1968 along with Bill Fernandez, who introduced Jobs to Steve Wozniak and would become Apple's first employee. Neither Jobs nor Fernandez, whose father was a lawyer, came from engineering households and thus decided to enroll in John McCollum's electronics I class. Jobs had grown his hair long and become involved in the growing counterculture, and the rebellious youth eventually clashed with McCollum and lost interest in the class. Jobs underwent a change during mid-1970. I got stoned for the first time. I discovered Shakespeare, Dylan Thomas, and all that classic stuff. 
I read Moby Dick and went back as a junior taking creative writing classes. Jobs later noted to his official biographer that, I started to listen to music a whole lot, and I started to read more outside of just science and technology, Shakespeare, Plato. I loved King Lear. When I was a senior I had this phenomenal AP English class. The teacher was this guy who looked like Ernest Hemingway. He took a bunch of us snowshoeing in Yosemite. During his last two years at Homestead High, Jobs developed two different interests, electronics and literature. These dual interests were particularly reflected during Jobs' senior year, as his best friends were Wozniak and his first girlfriend, the artistic Homestead junior Chris Ann Brennan. In 1971, after Wozniak began attending University of California, Berkeley, Jobs would visit him there a few times a week. This experience led him to study in nearby Stanford University's student union. Instead of joining the electronics club, Jobs put on light shows with a friend for Homestead's avant-garde jazz program. He was described by a Homestead classmate as kind of brain and kind of hippie, but he never fit into either group. He was smart enough to be a nerd, but wasn't nerdy. And he was too intellectual for the hippies, who just wanted to get wasted all the time. He was kind of an outsider. In high school everything revolved around what group you were in, and if you weren't in a carefully defined group, you weren't anybody. He was an individual, in a world where individuality was suspect. By his senior year in late 1971, he was taking a freshman English class at Stanford and working on a Homestead underground film project with Chris Ann Brennan. Around that time, Wozniak designed a low-cost digital, blue box, to generate the necessary tones to manipulate the telephone network, allowing free long-distance calls. He was inspired by an article titled, Secrets of the Little Blue Box, from the October 1971 issue of Esquire. Jobs decided then to sell them and split the profit with Wozniak. The clandestine sales of the illegal blue boxes went well and perhaps planted the seed in Jobs' mind that electronics could be both fun and profitable. In a 1994 interview, he recalled that it took six months for him and Wozniak to design the blue boxes. Jobs later reflected that had it not been for Wozniak's blue boxes, there wouldn't have been an Apple. He states it showed them that they could take on large companies and beat them. By his senior year of high school, Jobs began using LSD. He later recalled that on one occasion he consumed it in a wheat field outside Sunnyvale, and experienced the most wonderful feeling of my life up to that point. In mid-1972, after graduation and before leaving for Reed College, Jobs and Brennan rented a house from their other roommate, Al. In September 1972, Jobs enrolled at Reed College in Portland, Oregon. He insisted on applying only to Reed, although it was an expensive school that Paul and Clara could ill afford. Jobs soon befriended Robert Friedland, who was Reed's student body president at that time. Brennan remained involved with Jobs while he was at Reed. After just one semester, Jobs dropped out of Reed College without telling his parents. Jobs later explained this was because he did not want to spend his parents' money on an education that seemed meaningless to him. He continued to attend by auditing his classes, including a course on calligraphy that was taught by Robert Palladino. In a 2005 commencement speech at Stanford University, Jobs stated that during this period, he slept on the floor in friends' dorm rooms, returned Coke bottles for food money, and got weekly free meals at the local Hare Krishna temple. In that same speech, Jobs said, If I had never dropped in on that single calligraphy course in college, the Mac would have never had multiple typefaces or proportionally spaced fonts. In February 1974, Jobs returned to his parents' home in Los Altos and began looking for a job. He was soon hired by Atari, Inc. in Los Gatos, California, as a computer technician. Back in 1973, Steve Wozniak designed his own version of the classic video game Pong and gave its electronics board to Jobs. According to Wozniak, Atari only hired Jobs because he took the board down to the company, and they thought that he had built it himself. Atari's co-founder Nolan Bushnell later described him as difficult but valuable, pointing out that he was very often the smartest guy in the room, and he would let people know that. Jobs traveled to India in mid-1974 to visit Neem Karoli Baba at his Kanchi ashram with his Reed College friend and eventual Apple employee Daniel Kotke, searching for spiritual teachings. When they got to the Neem Karoli ashram, it was almost deserted because Neem Karoli Baba had died in September 1973. Then they made a long trek up a dry riverbed to an ashram of Haidakan Babaji. 
After seven months, Jobs left India and returned to the U.S. ahead of Daniel Kotke. Jobs had changed his appearance, his head was shaved, and he wore traditional Indian clothing. During this time, Jobs experimented with psychedelics, later calling his LSD experiences, one of the two or three most important things, he had, done in, his, life. He spent a period at the All One Farm, a commune in Oregon that was owned by Robert Friedland. During this time period, Jobs and Brennan both became practitioners of Zen Buddhism through the Zen master Koban Chino Otagawa. Jobs engaged in lengthy meditation retreats at the Tassajara Zen Mountain Center, the oldest Soto Zen monastery in the U.S. He considered taking up monastic residence at Aheji in Japan, and maintained a lifelong appreciation for Zen, Japanese cuisine, and artists such as Hasui Kawasi. Jobs returned to Atari in early 1975, and that summer, Bushnell assigned him to create a circuit board for the arcade video game Breakout in as few chips as possible, knowing that Jobs would recruit Wozniak for help. During his day job at HP, Wozniak drew sketches of the circuit design. At night, he joined Jobs at Atari and continued to refine the design, which Jobs implemented on a breadboard. According to Bushnell, Atari offered $100, equivalent to about $500 in 2022, for each TTL chip that was eliminated in the machine. Jobs made a deal with Wozniak to split the fee evenly between them if Wozniak could minimize the number of chips. Much to the amazement of Atari engineers, within four days Wozniak reduced the TTL count to 45, far below the usual 100, though Atari later re-engineered it to make it easier to test and add a few missing features. According to Wozniak, Jobs told him that Atari paid them only $750, instead of the actual $5,000, and that Wozniak's share was thus $375. Wozniak did not learn about the actual bonus until 10 years later but said that if Jobs had told him about it and explained that he needed the money, Wozniak would have given it to him. Jobs and Wozniak attended meetings of the Homebrew Computer Club in 1975, which was a stepping stone to the development and marketing of the first Apple computer. According to a document released by the DoD, circa 1975, Steve Jobs claims he was arrested in Eugene, Oregon after being questioned for being a minor in possession of alcohol. Jobs alleges that he didn't have any alcohol, but police questioned him and subsequently determined that he had an outstanding arrest warrant for an unpaid speeding ticket. Jobs claims he then paid the approximately $50 fine. The arrest allegedly occurred behind a store. By March 1976, Wozniak completed the basic design of the Apple I computer and showed it to Jobs, who suggested that they sell it. Wozniak was at first skeptical of the idea but later agreed. In April of that same year, Jobs, Wozniak, and administrative overseer Ronald Wayne founded Apple Computer Company, now called Apple Inc., as a business partnership in Jobs's parents' Chris Drive home on April 1, 1976. The operation originally started in Jobs's bedroom and later moved to the garage. Wayne stayed briefly, leaving Jobs and Wozniak as the active primary co-founders of the company. The two decided on the name, Apple, after Jobs returned from the All One Farm commune in Oregon and told Wozniak about his time in the farm's apple orchard. Jobs originally planned to produce bare printed circuit boards of the Apple I and sell them to computer hobbyists for $50, equivalent to about $260 in 2022, each. To fund the first batch, Wozniak sold his HP Scientific Calculator and Jobs sold his Volkswagen van. Later that year, computer retailer Paul Terrell purchased 50 fully assembled Apple I units for $500 each. Eventually about 200 Apple I computers were produced in total. A neighbor on Chris Drive recalled Jobs as an odd individual who would greet his clients, with his underwear hanging out, barefoot and hippie-like. Another neighbor, Larry Waterland, who had just earned his Ph.D. in chemical engineering at Stanford, recalled dismissing Jobs' budding business compared to the established industry of giant mainframe computers with big decks of punch cards. Steve took me over to the garage. He had a circuit board with a chip on it, a Dumont TV set, a Panasonic cassette tape deck and a keyboard. He said, this is an Apple computer. I said, you've got to be joking. I dismissed the whole idea. Jobs' friend from Reed College in India, Daniel Kotke, recalled that as an early Apple employee, he was the only person who worked in the garage. Woz would show up once a week with his latest code. 
Steve Jobs didn't get his hands dirty in that sense. Kotke also stated that much of the early work took place in Jobs's kitchen, where he spent hours on the phone trying to find investors for the company. They received funding from a then semi-retired Intel product marketing manager and engineer named Mike Markula. Scott McNeely, one of the co-founders of Sun Microsystems, said that Jobs broke a glass age ceiling in Silicon Valley because he'd created a very successful company at a young age. Markula brought Apple to the attention of Arthur Rock, which, after looking at the crowded Apple booth at the Home Brew Computer Show, started with a $60,000 investment and went on the Apple board. Jobs was not pleased when Markula recruited Mike Scott from National Semiconductor in February 1977 to serve as the first president and CEO of Apple. After Brennan returned from her own journey to India, she and Jobs fell in love again, as Brennan noted changes in him that she attributes to Coben, whom she was also still following. It was also at this time that Jobs displayed a prototype Apple II computer for Brennan and his parents in their living room. Brennan notes a shift in this time period, where the two main influences on Jobs were Apple Inc. and Coben. In April 1977, Jobs and Wozniak introduced the Apple II at the West Coast Computer Fair. It is the first consumer product to have been sold by Apple Computer. Primarily designed by Wozniak, Jobs oversaw the development of its unusual case and Rod Holt developed the unique power supply. During the design stage, Jobs argued that the Apple II should have two expansion slots, while Wozniak wanted eight. After a heated argument, Wozniak threatened that Jobs should go get himself another computer. They later agreed on eight slots. The Apple II became one of the first highly successful mass-produced microcomputer products in the world. As Jobs became more successful with his new company, his relationship with Brennan grew more complex. In 1977, the success of Apple was now a part of their relationship, and Brennan, Daniel Kotke, and Jobs moved into a house near the Apple office in Cupertino. Brennan eventually took a position in the shipping department at Apple. Brennan's relationship with Jobs deteriorated as his position with Apple grew, and she began to consider ending the relationship. In October 1977, Brennan was approached by Rod Holt, who asked her to take a paid apprenticeship designing blueprints for the Apples. Both Holt and Jobs believed that it would be a good position for her, given her artistic abilities. Holt was particularly eager that she take the position and puzzled by her ambivalence toward it. Brennan's decision, however, was overshadowed by the fact that she realized she was pregnant, and that Jobs was the father. It took her a few days to tell Jobs, whose face, according to Brennan, turned ugly, at the news. At the same time, according to Brennan, at the beginning of her third trimester, Jobs said to her, I never wanted to ask that you get an abortion. I just didn't want to do that. He also refused to discuss the pregnancy with her. Brennan turned down the internship and decided to leave Apple. She stated that Jobs told her, if you give up this baby for adoption, you will be sorry, and, I am never going to help you. According to Brennan, Jobs started to seed people with the notion that I slept around, and he was infertile, which meant that this could not be his child. A few weeks before she was due to give birth, Brennan was invited to deliver her baby at the All One Farm. She accepted the offer. When Jobs was 23, the same age as his biological parents when they had him, Brennan gave birth to her baby, Lisa Brennan, on May 17, 1978. Jobs went there for the birth after he was contacted by Robert Friedland, their mutual friend and the farm owner. While distant, Jobs worked with her on a name for the baby, which they discussed while sitting in the fields on a blanket. Brennan suggested the name, Lisa, which Jobs also liked and notes that Jobs was very attached to the name, Lisa, while he was also publicly denying paternity. She would discover later that during this time, Jobs was preparing to unveil a new kind of computer that he wanted to give a female name, his first choice was, Claire, after St. Clair. She stated that she never gave him permission to use the baby's name for a computer and he hid the plans from her. Jobs worked with his team to come up with the phrase, local integrated software architecture, as an alternative explanation for the Apple Lisa. Decades later, however, Jobs admitted to his biographer Walter Isaacson that, obviously, it was named for my daughter. When Jobs denied paternity, a DNA test established him as Lisa's father. It required him to pay Brennan $385, equivalent to about $1,100 in 2022, monthly in addition to returning the welfare money she had received. Jobs paid her $500, 
equivalent to about $1,500 in 2022, monthly at the time when Apple went public and made him a millionaire. Later, Brennan agreed to interview with Michael Moritz for Time magazine for its Time Person of the Year special, released on January 3, 1983, in which she discussed her relationship with Jobs. Rather than name Jobs the Person of the Year, the magazine named the generic personal computer the Machine of the Year. In the issue, Jobs questioned the reliability of the paternity test, which stated that the probability of paternity for Jobs, Stephen, is 94.1%. He responded by arguing that 28% of the male population of the United States could be the father. Time also noted that the baby girl and the machine on which Apple has placed so much hope for the future share the same name, Lisa. In 1978, at age 23, Jobs was worth over $1 million, equivalent to $4.49 million in 2022. By age 25, his net worth grew to an estimated $250 million, equivalent to $805 million in 2022. He was also one of the youngest people ever to make the Forbes list of the nation's richest people, and one of only a handful to have done it themselves, without inherited wealth. In 1982, Jobs bought an apartment on the top two floors of the San Remo, a Manhattan building with a politically progressive reputation. Although he never lived there, he spent years renovating it thanks to IM Pay. In 1983, Jobs lured John Scully away from Pepsi Cola to serve as Apple's CEO, asking, do you want to spend the rest of your life selling sugared water, or do you want a chance to change the world? In 1984, Jobs bought the Jackaling House and estate and resided there for a decade. Thereafter, he leased it out for several years until 2000 when he stopped maintaining the house, allowing weathering to degrade it. In 2004, Jobs received permission from the town of Woodside to demolish the house to build a smaller, contemporary-styled one. After a few years in court, the house was finally demolished in 2011, a few months before he died. Jobs took over development of the Macintosh in 1981, from early Apple employee Jeff Raskin, who had conceived the project. Wozniak and Raskin had heavily influenced the early program, and Wozniak was on leave during this time due to an airplane crash earlier that year, making it easier for Jobs to take over the project. On January 22, 1984, Apple aired a Super Bowl television commercial titled, 1984, which ended with the words, on January 24, Apple Computer will introduce Macintosh. And you'll see why 1984 won't be like 1984. On January 24, 1984, an emotional Jobs introduced the Macintosh to a wildly enthusiastic audience at Apple's annual shareholders meeting held in the Flint Auditorium at De Anza College. Macintosh engineer Andy Hertzfeld described the scene as pandemonium. The Macintosh was inspired by the Lisa, in turn inspired by Xerox PARC's mouse-driven graphical user interface, and it was widely acclaimed by the media with strong initial sales. However, its low performance and limited range of available software led to a rapid sales decline in the second half of 1984. Scully's and Jobs' respective visions for the company greatly differed. Scully favored open architecture computers like the Apple II, targeting education, small business, and home markets less vulnerable to IBM. Jobs wanted the company to focus on the closed architecture Macintosh as a business alternative to the IBM PC. President and CEO Scully had little control over chairman of the board Jobs's Macintosh division. It and the Apple II division operated like separate companies, duplicating services. Although its products provided 85% of Apple sales in early 1985, the company's January 1985 annual meeting did not mention the Apple II division or employees. Many left, including Wozniak, who stated that the company had been going in the wrong direction for the last five years, and sold most of his stock. Though frustrated with the company's and Jobs' dismissal of the Apple II in favor of the Macintosh, Wozniak left amicably and remained an honorary employee of Apple, maintaining a lifelong friendship with Jobs. By early 1985, the Macintosh's failure to defeat the IBM PC became clear, and it strengthened Scully's position in the company. In May 1985, Scully, encouraged by Arthur Rock, decided to reorganize Apple, and proposed a plan to the board that would remove Jobs from the Macintosh group and put him in charge of new product development. This move would effectively render Jobs powerless within Apple. In response, 
Jobs then developed a plan to get rid of Scully and take over Apple. However, Jobs was confronted after the plan was leaked, and he said that he would leave Apple. The board declined his resignation and asked him to reconsider. Scully also told Jobs that he had all of the votes needed to go ahead with the reorganization. A few months later, on September 17, 1985, Jobs submitted a letter of resignation to the Apple board. Five additional senior Apple employees also resigned and joined Jobs in his new venture, Next. The Macintosh's struggle continued after Jobs left Apple. Though marketed and received in fanfare, the expensive Macintosh was hard to sell. In 1985, Bill Gates's then-developing company, Microsoft, threatened to stop developing Mac applications unless it was granted a license for the Mac operating system software. Microsoft was developing its graphical user interface for DOS, which it was calling Windows and didn't want Apple to sue over the similarities between the Windows GUI and the Mac interface. Scully granted Microsoft the license which later led to problems for Apple. In addition, cheap IBM PC clones that ran Microsoft software and had a graphical user interface began to appear. Although the Macintosh preceded the clones, it was far more expensive, so, through the late 1980s, the Windows user interface was getting better and better and was thus taking increasingly more share from Apple. Windows-based IBM PC clones also led to the development of additional GUIs such as IBM's TopView or Digital Research's GEM, and thus, the graphical user interface was beginning to be taken for granted, undermining the most apparent advantage of the Mac. It seemed clear as the 1980s wound down that Apple couldn't go it alone indefinitely against the whole IBM clone market. Following his resignation from Apple in 1985, Jobs founded Next Inc. with $7 million. A year later he was running out of money, and he sought venture capital with no product on the horizon. Eventually, Jobs attracted the attention of billionaire Ross Perot, who invested heavily in the company. The next computer was shown to the world in what was considered Jobs's comeback event, a lavish invitation-only gala launch event that was described as a multimedia extravaganza. The celebration was held at the Louise M. Davies Symphony Hall, San Francisco, California, on Wednesday, October 12, 1988. Steve Wozniak said in a 2013 interview that while Jobs was at Next he was, really getting his head together. Next workstations were first released in 1990 and priced at $9,999, equivalent to about $22,000 in 2022. Like the Apple Lisa, the Next workstation was technologically advanced and designed for the education sector but was largely dismissed as cost prohibitive. The Next workstation was known for its technical strengths, chief among them its object-oriented software development system. Jobs marketed Next products to the financial, scientific, and academic community, highlighting its innovative, experimental new technologies, such as the mock kernel, the digital signal processor chip, and the built-in Ethernet port. Making use of a Next computer, English computer scientist Tim Berners-Lee invented the World Wide Web in 1990 at CERN in Switzerland. The revised, second-generation Nextcube was released in 1990. Jobs touted it as the first, interpersonal, computer that would replace the personal computer. With its innovative NEXT mail multimedia email system, Nextcube could share voice, image, graphics, and video in email for the first time. Interpersonal computing is going to revolutionize human communications and group work, Jobs told reporters. Jobs ran Next with an obsession for aesthetic perfection, as evidenced by the development of and attention to Nextcube's magnesium case. This put considerable strain on Next's hardware division, and in 1993, after having sold only 50,000 machines, Next transitioned fully to software development with the release of Next Step, Intel. The company reported its first yearly profit of $1.03 million in 1994. In 1996, Next Software, Inc. released WebObjects, a framework for web application development. After Next was acquired by Apple Inc. in 1997, WebObjects was used to build and run the Apple Store, MobileMe services, and the iTunes Store. In 1986, Jobs funded the spin-out of the graphics group, later renamed Pixar, from Lucasfilm's computer graphics division for the price of $10 million, $5 million of which was given to the company as capital and $5 million of which was paid to Lucasfilm for technology rights. The first film produced by Pixar with its Disney partnership, Toy Story, 1995, with Jobs credited as executive producer, 
brought financial success and critical acclaim to the studio when it was released. Over the course of Jobs's life, under Pixar's creative chief John Lasseter, the company produced box office hits A Bug's Life, 1998, Toy Story 2, 1999, Monsters, Inc., 2001, Finding Nemo, 2003, The Incredibles, 2004, Cars, 2006, Ratatouille, 2007, Wally, 2008, Up, 2009, Toy Story 3, 2010, and Cars 2, 2011. Brave, 2012, Pixar's first film to be produced since Jobs' death, honored him with a tribute for his contributions to the studio. 121, Finding Nemo, The Incredibles, Ratatouille, Wally, Up, Toy Story 3, and Brave each received the Academy Award for Best Animated Feature, an award introduced in 2001. In 2003 and 2004, as Pixar's contract with Disney was running out, Jobs and Disney chief executive Michael Eisner tried but failed to negotiate a new partnership, and in January 2004, Jobs announced that he would never deal with Disney again. Pixar sought a new partner to distribute its films after its contract expired. In October 2005, Bob Iger replaced Eisner at Disney, and Iger quickly worked to mend relations with Jobs and Pixar. On January 24, 2006, Jobs and Iger announced that Disney had agreed to purchase Pixar in an all-stock transaction worth $7.4 billion. When the deal closed, Jobs became the Walt Disney Company's largest single shareholder with approximately 7% of the company's stock. Jobs' holdings in Disney far exceeded those of Eisner, who holds 1.7%, and of Disney family member Roy E. Disney, who until his 2009 death held about 1% of the company's stock and whose criticisms of Eisner, especially that he soured Disney's relationship with Pixar, accelerated Eisner's ousting. Upon completion of the merger, Jobs received 7% of Disney shares, and joined the board of directors as the largest individual shareholder. Upon Jobs' death his shares in Disney were transferred to the Stephen P. Jobs Trust led by Lorene Jobs. After Jobs' death, Iger recalled in 2019 that many warned him about Jobs, that he would bully me and everyone else. Iger wrote, who wouldn't want Steve Jobs to have influence over how a company is run? And that as an active Disney board member, he rarely created trouble for me. Not never but rarely. He speculated that they would have seriously considered merging Disney and Apple had Jobs lived. Floyd Norman, of Pixar, described Jobs as a mature, mellow individual, who never interfered with the creative process of the filmmakers. In early June 2014, Pixar co-founder and Walt Disney Animation Studios president Edwin Catmull revealed that Jobs once advised him to, just explain it to them until they understand, in disagreements. Catmull released the book Creativity, Inc. in 2014, in which he recounts numerous experiences of working with Jobs. Regarding his own manner of dealing with Jobs, Catmull writes, In all the 26 years with Steve, Steve and I never had one of these loud verbal arguments, and it's not my nature to do that. But we did disagree fairly frequently about things. I would say something to him and he would immediately shoot it down because he could think faster than I could. I would then wait a week. I'd call him up, and I'd give my counter-argument to what he had said, and he'd immediately shoot it down. So I had to wait another week, and occasionally this went on for months. But ultimately one of three things happened. About a third of the time he said, oh, I get it, you're right, and that was the end of it. And it was another third of the time in which, I'd, say, actually I think he is right. The other third of the time, where we didn't reach consensus, he just let me do it my way, never said anything more about it. In 1996, Jobs's former company Apple was struggling and its survival depended on completing its next operating system. After failed negotiations to purchase B Inc., Apple eventually came to a deal with Next in December for $400 million. The deal was finalized in February 1997, bringing Jobs back to the company he had co-founded. Jobs became de facto chief after then-CEO Gil Emilio was ousted in July 1997. He was formally named interim chief executive on September 16. In March 1998, to concentrate Apple's efforts on returning to profitability, Jobs terminated several projects, such as Newton, Cyberdog, and OpenDoc. In the coming months, many employees developed a fear of encountering jobs while riding in the elevator, afraid that they might not have a job when the doors opened. The reality was that Jobs's summary executions were rare, 
but a handful of victims was enough to terrorize a whole company. Jobs changed the licensing program for Macintosh clones, making it too costly for the manufacturers to continue making machines. With the purchase of Next, much of the company's technology found its way into Apple products, most notably Next Step, which evolved into Mac OS X. Under Jobs's guidance, the company increased sales significantly with the introduction of the iMac and other new products. Since then, appealing designs and powerful branding have worked well for Apple. At the 2000 Macworld Expo, Jobs officially dropped the interim modifier from his title at Apple and became permanent CEO. Jobs quipped at the time that he would be using the title ICEO. The company subsequently branched out, introducing and improving upon other digital appliances. With the introduction of the iPod Portable Music Player, iTunes Digital Music Software, and the iTunes Store, the company made forays into consumer electronics and music distribution. On June 29, 2007, Apple entered the cellular phone business with the introduction of the iPhone, a multi-touch display cell phone, which also included the features of an iPod and, with its own mobile browser, revolutionized the mobile browsing scene. While nurturing open-ended innovation, Jobs also reminded his employees that real artistship. Jobs had a public war of words with Dell Computer CEO Michael Dell, starting in 1987, when Jobs first criticized Dell for making uninnovative beige boxes. On October 6, 1997, at a Gartner symposium, when Dell was asked what he would do if he ran the then-troubled Apple Computer Company, he said, I'd shut it down and give the money back to the shareholders. Then, in 2006, Jobs emailed all employees when Apple's market capitalization rose above Dell's. It read, Team, it turned out that Michael Dell wasn't perfect at predicting the future. Based on today's stock market close, Apple is worth more than Dell. Stocks go up and down, and things may be different tomorrow, but I thought it was worth a moment of reflection today. Steve. Jobs was both admired and criticized for his consummate skill at persuasion and salesmanship, which has been dubbed the reality distortion field, and was particularly evident during his keynote speeches, colloquially known as Steve Notes, at Macworld Expos and at Apple Worldwide Developers Conferences. Jobs usually went to work wearing a black long-sleeved mock turtleneck made by Issey Miyake, Levi's 501 blue jeans, and New Balance 991 sneakers. Jobs told his biographer Walter Isaacson, he came to like the idea of having a uniform for himself, both because of its daily convenience, the rationale he claimed, and its ability to convey a signature style. Jobs was a board member at Gap Inc. from 1999 to 2002. In 2001, Jobs was granted stock options in the amount of 7.5 million shares of Apple with an exercise price of $18.30. It was alleged that the options had been backdated, and that the exercise price should have been $21.10. It was further alleged that Jobs had thereby incurred taxable income of $20 million that he did not report, and that Apple overstated its earnings by that same amount. As a result, Jobs potentially faced a number of criminal charges and civil penalties. The case was the subject of active criminal and civil government investigations, though an independent internal Apple investigation completed on December 29, 2006, found that Jobs was unaware of these issues and that the options granted to him were returned without being exercised in 2003. In 2005, Jobs responded to criticism of Apple's poor recycling programs for e-waste in the U.S. by lashing out at environmental and other advocates at Apple's annual meeting in Cupertino in April. A few weeks later, Apple announced it would take back iPods for free at its retail stores. The computer take-back campaign responded by flying a banner from a plane over the Stanford University graduation at which Jobs was the commencement speaker. The banner read, Steve, don't be a mini-player, recycle all e-waste. In 2006, he further expanded Apple's recycling programs to any U.S. customer who buys a new Mac. This program includes shipping and, environmentally friendly disposal, of their old systems. The success of Apple's unique products and services provided several years of stable financial returns, propelling Apple to become the world's most valuable publicly traded company in 2011. Jobs was perceived as a demanding perfectionist who always aspired to position his businesses and their products at the forefront of the information technology industry by foreseeing and setting innovation and style trends. 
He summed up this self-concept at the end of his keynote speech at the Macworld Conference and Expo in January 2007, by quoting ice hockey player Wayne Gretzky. There's an old Wayne Gretzky quote that I love. I skate to where the puck is going to be, not where it has been. And we've always tried to do that at Apple. Since the very, very beginning. And we always will. On July 1, 2008, a $7 billion class action suit was filed against several members of the Apple Board of Directors for revenue lost because of alleged securities fraud. In a 2011 interview with biographer Walter Isaacson, Jobs revealed that he had met with U.S. President Barack Obama, complained about the nation's shortage of software engineers, and told Obama that he was headed for a one-term presidency. Jobs proposed that any foreign student who got an engineering degree at a U.S. university should automatically be offered a green card. After the meeting, Jobs commented, the president is very smart, but he kept explaining to us reasons why things can't get done. It infuriates me. Jobs died at his home in Palo Alto, California, around 3 p.m. PDT, on October 5, 2011, due to complications from a relapse of his previously treated islet cell pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, which resulted in respiratory arrest. He had lost consciousness the day before and died with his wife, children, and sisters at his side. His sister, Mona Simpson, described his death thus. Steve's final words, hours earlier, were monosyllables, repeated three times. Before embarking, he looked at his sister Patty, then for a long time at his children, then at his life's partner, Loreen, and then over their shoulders past them. Steve's final words were, oh wow, oh wow, oh wow. He then lost consciousness and died several hours later. A small private funeral was held on October 7, 2011, the details of which, out of respect for Jobs's family, were not made public. Both Apple and Pixar issued announcements of his death. Apple announced on the same day that they had no plans for a public service, but were encouraging well-wishers to send their remembrance messages to an email address created to receive such messages. Apple and Microsoft both flew their flags at half-staff throughout their respective headquarters and campuses. Bob Iger ordered all Disney properties, including Walt Disney World and Disneyland, to fly their flags at half-staff from October 6 to 12, 2011. For two weeks following his death, Apple displayed on its corporate website a simple page that showed Jobs' name and lifespan next to his portrait in grayscale. On October 19, 2011, Apple employees held a private memorial service for Jobs on the Apple campus in Cupertino. It was attended by Jobs's widow, Lorene, and by Tim Cook, Bill Campbell, Nora Jones, Al Gore, and Coldplay. Some of Apple's retail stores closed briefly so employees could attend the memorial. A video of the service was uploaded to Apple's website. California Governor Jerry Brown declared Sunday, October 16, 2011, to be Steve Jobs Day. On that day, an invitation-only memorial was held at Stanford University. Those in attendance included Apple and other tech company executives, members of the media, celebrities, politicians, and family and close friends of Jobs. Bono, Yo-Yo Ma, and Joan Baez performed at the service, which lasted longer than an hour. There was high security with guards at all of the university's gates, and a helicopter overhead from an area news station. Each attendee was given a small brown box as a farewell gift from Jobs, containing a copy of the autobiography of a yogi, 1946, by Paramahansa Yogananda. Childhood friend and fellow Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak, former owner of what would become Pixar, George Lucas, his competitor Microsoft co-founder Bill Gates, and President Barack Obama all made statements in response to his death. At his request, Jobs was buried in an unmarked grave at Alta Mesa Memorial Park, the only non-sectarian cemetery in Palo Alto. Jobs's design aesthetic was influenced by philosophies of Zen and Buddhism. In India, he experienced Buddhism while on his seven-month spiritual journey, and his sense of intuition was influenced by the spiritual people with whom he studied. Jobs gained insights regarding industrial designs from Richard Sapper. According to Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak, Steve didn't ever code. He wasn't an engineer and he didn't do any original design. Daniel Kotke, one of Apple's earliest employees and a college friend of Jobs, stated, between Woz and Jobs, Woz was the innovator, the inventor. Steve Jobs was the marketing person. 
He is listed as either primary inventor or co-inventor in 346 United States patents or patent applications related to a range of technologies from actual computer and portable devices to user interfaces, including touch-based, speakers, keyboards, power adapters, staircases, clasps, sleeves, lanyards, and packages. His contributions to most of his patents were to the look and feel of the product. He and his industrial design chief Jonathan Ive are named for 200 of the patents. Most of these are design patents as opposed to utility patents or inventions. They are specific product designs such as both original and lamp style IMAX and PowerBook G4 Titanium. He holds 43 issued U.S. patents on inventions The patent on the Mac OS X dock user interface with magnification feature was issued the day before he died. Although Jobs had little involvement in the engineering and technical side of the original Apple computers, Jobs later used his CEO position to directly involve himself with product design. Involved in many projects throughout his career was his longtime marketing executive and confidant Joanna Hoffman, known as one of the few employees at Apple and Next who could successfully stand up to Jobs while also engaging with him. Even while terminally ill in the hospital, Jobs sketched new devices that would hold the iPad in a hospital bed. He despised the oxygen monitor on his finger, and suggested ways to revise the design for simplicity. Since his death, he has won 141 patents. He holds over 450 patents in total. In 1989, Jobs first met his future wife, Lorreen Powell, when he gave a lecture at the Stanford Graduate School of Business, where she was a student. Soon after the event, he stated that Lorreen was right there in the front row in the lecture hall, and I couldn't take my eyes off of her kept losing my train of thought, and started feeling a little giddy. After the lecture, he met her in the parking lot and invited her out to dinner. From that point forward, they were together, with a few minor exceptions, for the rest of his life. Jobs proposed on New Year's Day 1990 with, a fistful of freshly picked wildflowers. They married on March 18, 1991, in a Buddhist ceremony at the Awani Hotel in Yosemite National Park. 50 people, including Jobs' father, Paul, and his sister Mona, attended. The ceremony was conducted by Jobs' guru, Koben Chino Otagawa. The vegan wedding cake was in the shape of Yosemite's half dome, and the wedding ended with a hike and Lorene's brother's snowball fight. Jobs reportedly said to Mona, You see, Mona. Lorene is descended from Joe Namath, and we're descended from John Muir. Jobs's and Powell's first child, a son named Reed, was born in 1991. Jobs's father, Paul, died a year and a half later, on March 5, 1993. Jobs's childhood home remains a tourist attraction and is currently owned by his stepmother, Paul's second wife, Marilyn Jobs. Jobs and Powell had two more children, daughters Aaron, B. 1995, and Eve Jobs, B. 1998, who is a fashion model. The family lived in Palo Alto, California. Although a billionaire, Jobs made it known that, like Bill Gates, he had stipulated that most of his monetary fortune would not be left to his children. Both men had limited their children's access, age appropriate, to social media, computer games, and the internet. Jobs's views and actions on philanthropy and charity are a public mystery. He maintained privacy even over what few of these actions were publicly known. He has been a key figure in public discussions about societal obligations of the wealthy and powerful. Through his career, the media investigated and criticized him and Apple as unusually and inexplicably mysterious or absent among powerful leaders and especially billionaires. His name is absent from the million-dollar list of all large global philanthropy. Some have speculated about his possible secret role in large anonymous donations. Mark Vermillion, former charitable leader for Joan Baez, Apple, and Jobs, attributed Jobs's lifelong minimization of direct charity to his perfectionism and limited time. Jobs, Vermillion, and supporters said over the years that corporate products were Jobs's superior contributions to culture and society instead of direct charity. In 1985, Jobs said, You know, my main reaction to this money thing is that it's humorous, all the attention to it, because it's hardly the most insightful or valuable thing that's happened to me. Shortly after leaving Apple, he formed the charitable Stephen P. Jobs Foundation, led by Mark Vermillion, hired away from Apple's community leadership. Jobs wanted a focus on nutrition and vegetarianism, but Vermillion wanted social entrepreneurship. 
That year, Jobs soon launched Next and closed the foundation with no results. Upon his 1997 return to Apple, Jobs optimized the failing company to the core, such as eliminating all philanthropic programs, never to be restored. In 2007, Stanford Social Innovation Review magazine listed Apple among America's least philanthropic companies. A few months after another unflattering news report, Apple started a program to match employees' charitable gifts. Jobs declined to sign the Giving Pledge, launched in 2010 by Warren Buffett and Bill Gates for fellow billionaires. He donated $50 million to Stanford Hospital and contributed to efforts to cure AIDS. Bono reported, tens of millions of dollars, given by Apple while Jobs was CEO, to AIDS and HIV relief programs in Africa, which inspired other companies to join. 1985. Awarded National Medal of Technology, with Steve Wozniak, by U.S. President Ronald Reagan, the country's highest honor for technological achievements. 1987. Jefferson Award for Public Service. 1989. Entrepreneur of the Decade by Inc. 1991. Howard Vollum Award from Reed College. 2004-2010. Listed among the Time 100 Most Influential People in the World on five separate occasions. 2007. Named the most powerful person in business by Fortune magazine. 2007. Inducted into the California Hall of Fame. Located at the California Museum for History, Women and the Arts. 2012. Grammy Trustees Award, an award for those who have influenced the music industry in areas unrelated to performance. 2012. Posthumously honored with an Edison Achievement Award for his commitment to innovation throughout his career. 2013. Posthumously inducted as a Disney legend. 2017. Steve Jobs Theater opens at Apple Park. 2022. Posthumously awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by U.S. President Joe Biden, the country's highest civilian honor. The following are quotes from Steve Jobs. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. Have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. They somehow already know what you truly want to become. Everything else is secondary. Sometimes life's going to hit you in the head with a brick. Don't lose faith. I'm convinced that the only thing that kept me going was that I loved what I did. Taking LSD was a profound experience, one of the most important things in my life. LSD shows you that there's another side to the coin, and you can't remember it when it wears off, but you know it. It reinforced my sense of what was important, creating great things instead of making money putting things back into the stream of history and of human consciousness as much as I could. Why join the Navy if you can be a pirate? The only way to do great work is to love what you do. If you haven't found it yet, keep looking. Don't settle. The heaviness of being successful was replaced by the lightness of being a beginner again. I've read something that Bill Gates said about six months ago. He said, I worked really, really hard in my 20s. And I know what he means, because I worked really, really hard in my 20s too. Literally, you know, seven days a week, a lot of hours every day. And it actually is a wonderful thing to do, because you can get a lot done. But you can't do it forever, and you don't want to do it forever and you have to come up with ways of figuring out what the most important things are and working with other people even more. That's been one of my mantras, focus and simplicity. Simple can be harder than complex. You have to work hard to get your thinking clean to make it simple. But it's worth it in the end because once you get there, you can move mountains. You know who the best managers are? They're the great individual contributors, who never ever want to be a manager, but decide they have to be manager because no one else is going to be able to do as good a job as them. People who know what they are talking about don't need PowerPoint. Sometimes life hits you in the head with a brick. Don't lose faith. Your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. Don't be trapped by dogma which is living with the results of other people's thinking. 
The ones who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. Apple at the core, its core value, is that we believe that people with passion can change the world for the better. And that those people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who actually do. The unions are the worst thing that ever happened to education because it's not a meritocracy. It turns into a bureaucracy, which is exactly what has happened. The teachers can't teach and administrators run the place and nobody can be fired. It's terrible. Remember, design isn't just about aesthetics, it's about functionality too. Keep it simple, intuitive and effective. Inspired by, design is not just what it looks like and feels like. Design is how it works. Your work is going to fill a large part of your life, and the only way to be truly satisfied is to do what you believe is great work. And the only way to do great work is to love what you do. Innovation distinguishes between a leader and a follower. Computers are like a bicycle for the mind. Quote, computers themselves, and software yet to be developed, will revolutionize the way we learn. When you're doing something for yourself, or your best friend or family, you're not going to cheese out. If you don't love something, you're not going to go the extra mile, work the extra weekend, challenge the status quo as much. I naively chose a college that was almost as expensive as Stanford, and all of my working class parents' savings were being spent on my college tuition. After six months, I couldn't see the value in it. I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life and no idea how college was going to help me figure it out. And here I was spending all of the money my parents had saved their entire life. So I decided to drop out and trust that it would all work out okay. It was pretty scary at the time, but looking back it was one of the best decisions I ever made. The minute I dropped out I could stop taking the required classes that didn't interest me, and begin dropping in on the ones that looked interesting. I was worth about over a million dollars when I was 23 and over 10 million dollars when I was 24, and over a hundred million dollars when I was 25 and it wasn't that important, because I never did it for the money. I'd been rejected, but I was still in love, so I decided to start over. At Apple, people are putting in 18-hour days. We attract a different type of person, a person who doesn't want to wait 5 or 10 years to have someone take a giant risk on him or her. Someone who really wants to get in a little over his head and make a little dent in the universe. We are aware that we are doing something significant. We're here at the beginning of it and we're able to shape how it goes. Everyone here has the sense that right now is one of those moments when we are influencing the future. The Macintosh was sort of like this wonderful romance in your life that you once had and that produced about 10 million children. In a way it will never be over in your life. You'll still smell that romance every morning when you get up. And when you open the window, the cool air will hit your face, and you'll smell that romance in the air. And you'll see your children around, and you feel good about it. And nothing will ever make you feel bad about it. Finally Jobs proposed Apple Computer. I was on one of my fruitarian diets, he explained. I had just come back from the apple farm. It sounded fun, spirited, and not intimidating. Apple took the edge off the word, computer. Plus, it would get us ahead of Atari in the phone book. 